The next frontier is here. Rocket Lab uh, showed us today what they are building. It is the Neutron rocket. It is a larger rocket than the one they already are using to put satellites into orbit, powered by a phenomenal new engine, the Archimedes engine. But what some of us thought would be really cool is the composite material and not metal that is the skin of this beast of a vehicle. Let's talk about where this is all headed with Peter Beck, Rocket Lab CEO. I have to say the video uh, in which you explain to us what is being built by Rocket Lab. We, we tend to focus on other rocket companies and yet here you are very quietly building the future. And that composite material is remarkable. Tell us how that makes what you're doing more efficient and I'm going to put you perhaps yeah, well, thanks very much, Adam. Last time we spoke, you told me I was too boring, so we, we made sure we lifted our game on the video. But, um, you know, quite honestly, the, the composite material is, is really important because um, when you're talking about launch vehicles, it's all, a, it's all a mass equation. So if you can take the mass out of all of the structures, then everything else becomes far, far easier. Propulsion comes e becomes easier, uh, you know, re-entry becomes easier, landing the vehicle becomes easier. So we, we really focused on, um, on, on composite materials as, as we have in the rockets behind us for our Electron product and applied them to, to this new class of launch vehicle. And the, the composite materials are pretty amazing. What I'm watching on the screen there is even more amazing, that vertical landing. And we've seen these before in the middle of the ocean. And I just want to say, one of my favorite games as a kid was Hungry Hungry Hippo, and you kind of adopted, co-opted some of that for the, uh, for the vehicle here. Tell us about it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, this is a, a reusable launch vehicle, um, but reusable back to the launch site, because if you actually distill about, about you know, what, what, what actually drives cost in a rocket, it's not actually the bill of materials or the parts of the rocket, it's the operations. And um, if you can launch a rocket and return it back to the same place that you launched it, you save a tremendous amount of, of cost. And the same goes with the, the, the fairings and the nose cones. I mean, uh, why, why throw them away? Let's, let's just keep them together. And you know the composites materials kind of unlock all of that because you have you have the ability to build really optimized structures from a mass perspective and, and make all these sorts of things possible. What, what was really interesting in the explanation video too is when Jared says hungry hungry hippos, I was thinking Moonraker. That's how old I am when you know the thing <laughs> opens up and the next vehicle comes out. But that's where you're yeah. going to be not only more efficient, but the Archimedes engine doesn't have to, as you you point out, go full throttle because the composite material makes the rocket that much lighter. How is this going to give you an advantage? Because you also talk about in the next 10 years the hundreds upon hundreds of smaller, lighter satellites that are going to be launched around the globe. Look, at the end of the day, this is all about creating access to space, um, doing it as affordably and as reliably as possible. And, um, and th this is the vehicle that we're bringing to market that we think ultimately will, will open all of this up. Um, so so that, that, that's really the point of the whole program. It's optimized for uh, constellation deployments, but equally well, um, it's suitable for human space flight. Uh, and also, you know, interplanetary work, which which we love to do as well. And do you have any have any timetable for uh, human launches in the spacecraft? If you haven't already. Yeah, look, I mean, our focus right now is on cargo, and we'll put a vehicle out on the pad in 2024 and start commercial flights in 25, all going well. Um, really, the, the the human space flight market, we need to let develop a little bit more. I mean, if we're honest, there's really one customer for human space flight right now, and that's NASA. And that, that customer is very well served with, with two great providers. Um, so as we see the, the human spaceflight market continue to grow, we'll make, we're making sure that we're poised to be able to take advantage of that. Peter, my team has corrected me. It's not Moonraker. It's You Only Live Twice, but it's still a very cool Bond film. Uh, this composite material, is this proprietary to Rocket Lab? Because when I, the, the demonstration you do with that steel girder slamming into it and nothing happens to it, Yep. The, the, the implications for that material in other uses, I would imagine, are tremendous. Well, I mean, look, composite materials have been used vastly in, in, in all other industries and, and applications. Uh, we were the first to ever build a carbon composite rocket and send it to orbit. Um, and look, there, there, is a, there is a high learning threshold to overcome to be able to use composite materials. But once that threshold is achieved, um, then, then you know, it, it, it's pretty straightforward. So one, one of the, the key elements for us as well is it's not just the material itself, but the manufacturing process. So you know, typically composites, are, you know, people kind of complain that they're slow and expensive to build. And if you're doing it in a traditional sense, then that, that's true. 
but you know we're adopting um, automated fibre placement machines. So kind of think of it like 3D printing carbon fibre, except you're not 3D printing millimetres a minute, you're you know, printing metres a minute or yards a minute. Um, so it's a very, very rapid way of, of, of building these high, high performance structures. And just for, for the science geek inside me, I'm curious, this vehicle, does the composite material negate the need for uh, the kind of tiles you see on the space shuttle, so that re-entry you don't have the, the fire or the, the, the potential for destruction of the rocket as it comes back to Earth? Well, this is a great thing. So, you know, weight or lightness on a launch vehicle is, is just supremely good in every way. And the lighter you can make it, the less problems you have. So if you notice, the, you'll see the, the Neutron has got a very large base diameter. Um, and that gives us a really good ballistic coefficient, meaning that when we re-enter this atmosphere, uh, we've got a lot of area, and we let a lot of the atmosphere take, you know, take care of the work. But that only works if the, if the vehicle is very light. I mean, think about standing on top of a roof and throwing off a tennis ball or throwing off an umbrella. You know, the tennis ball plummets to the earth, the umbrella sort of gently floats down. And that's a real advantage in building such a lightweight vehicle, is, is that with a high ballistic coefficient, is the entry loads or the thermal loads on, on re-entry are far, far reduced. Peter Beck, you are anything but boring. You are taking us where no one has gone before, to uh, quote a Star Trek geek, me. Uh, all the best to you, and we look forward to developments on the Neutron rocket and the Archimedes engines. Peter Beck is the CEO at Rocket Lab. Do come back soon.